Welcome back to another episode of the Paper Stack Podcast. I'm Rick Allen. This is Brett Berkey. And boy, do we have a doozy today. I know, a professional radio person. Oh, man. I feel I'm nervous, actually. I'm like, <laughs> I'm being judged by one of my peers. And not just in the note investing game, but we're excited, man. We are excited yep. to have you, Patrick. Welcome to the show, Patrick Franz. Hey, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you, fellas. I appreciate the invitation to be on this wonderful show with two wonderful gentlemen. Yeah, definitely. Not only is he an esteemed radio host and uh, one hell of a note investor, but he's also a golfer who I've yet to get out on the course with and uh, smack a little white ball around. So I'm, I'm anxious to do that at some point. But that's not why we're here today. We're here today uh, for another episode of our first note purchase. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I can't wait to dive in because you are doing some really, really good stuff right now. But before we dive into what you're doing right now, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us where you came from, how you got in the note space and kind of unpack and tell us the story of how you arrived here today. Wild story, right? Some of you guys that may, some people kind of know my backstory a little bit, but it was uh, always trying to chase the dream. You know, I was that guy since I was about 15 years old when I got my first telemarketing job. So I didn't even have a work permit yet, but I, I, I you know, wasn't going to go work at Wiener Schnitzel like some of my other buddies. That just didn't seem cool to me uh, or Jack in the Box or whatever. Um, so I went and I, I got a job as a telemarketer because my older sister had an ad specs company where we sold stuff over the telephone to businesses like pins and keychains and stuff with their logos on them. Uh, and it all started then. I kind of like just got attracted to being able to be in a different job set where you can use like some skill set, some gift of gab and things like that to elevate your income over, say, just the regular hourly wage. So that's kind of like what sparked everything. And, uh, you know, by the time I was 19, I was trying to sell venture capital for startup.com companies uh, in La Jolla at a, at a VC firm. And kind of doing telemarketing on steroids, right? But that was my first taste of that you could call somebody on the telephone that's never met you before and get them to send $50,000 in a FedEx envelope <clears throat> to invest in a startup company. So I, I thought that was kind of a, in, an interesting lesson learned and also a lesson learned to work with some people that maybe would step, our, uh, step on their own grandmother in order to make a million, right? So learn how to do business the wrong way, but also learn that you can raise private capital from individuals and I learned that when I was about 19 years old. Um, so good lessons. Yeah, good lesson to start that off. And then um, went into sales management, tried to go the corporate route, uh, you know, had 25, 30 sales reps under me as a sales trainer, sales manager of a big uh, remodeling company that stretched Southern California and uh, did that for a while and ended up wanting to be one of the people that want to invent something. If, yeah, we've all come up with a great invention idea at one point or another and said, man, if I could put that on the market, I'd be rich. Well, I was one of those guys, but I actually did, I did go ahead and go all the way of raising funds, putting it together, building a team around my invention idea that went from sticky note to product. And uh, I launched my invented product after three patents uh, at the CES show in Vegas in 2009. And uh, so I, yeah, I invented the world's first auto finding key fob. So the little key fob that we have on our keychain that unlocks your car and pops your trunk. I made one of those locate your vehicle from over a half mile away. So you'd never lose your car in a parking lot or parking structure ever again. So it was auto finder. And so I invented the auto finder key fob. Um, and, but you know, as things would have it, I had a deal with general motors on my desk. Um, before I launched the retail product or the standalone product at the CES show in 2009, I already had a, a deal with GM on my desk where they were going to uh, implement my product into the manufacturing line and have all GM motor vehicles come with an auto finding key fob. And the economy fell apart by timing. The economy fell apart. Right. So folks listen to this podcast, uh, you know, the most brilliant ideas and the most brilliant path and, and, and the most brilliant team and so on and so forth, sometimes out of your control. And when the whole world blew up financially, if those of you who remember that in 08, um, GM needed a bailout. General Motors needed a government bailout to even stay in business anymore. So it was interesting. I got a fax uh, saying, hey, here's our you know 180 page agreement 
<laughs> that I needed to then have my attorney start reviewing. And the three or four weeks during when my attorney was reviewing the agreement I was to sign with GM, I got another fax that said, sorry, General Motors is getting a government bailout. We're no longer accepting new products into the manufacturing line. So that company uh, had its fair issues and I had to let it go through a stock trade to let my investors stay healthy. And I ended up taking it in the shorts and, and spending seven and a half years of my life to be this close to major success and then have it all back to square one again. And so anyways, it went back. Yeah, went, went back into sales management and stuff. So, I, and I, you know, I could throw in three or four network marketing company stories in between this whole, this whole thing, but the, the, naturally, but you know, you know, the, the, the point of the matter, right, is, is that I was, I was, I wasn't, I wasn't failing financially by way of lack of hustle, right? <laughs> like lack of initiative. I was doing things that people thought was amazing. Like I should have been a millionaire. People said, man, I can't believe you're not a millionaire, man. You're doing all this crazy stuff, but it was just nothing ever hit, right? The timing was never right. <clears throat> and I went to dead end to dead end to dead end. And I literally was, uh, was, uh, back in a sales management position, believe it or not, because I went into what was super duper easy for me to get a job. Like I didn't even have to go for an interview. I made a few phone calls and my buddy hired, hired me as general sales manager of one of the biggest companies in San Diego. Cause he's like, you're back. Right. I was highly sought after in that business. And I was working that business, 26 sales reps underneath me working 12 hours a day, six days a week, back into my old sales management career. And I stumbled across Desi, who you guys know. And I stumbled across Desi because I started dating his daughter, which is a, the, the funniest part of it. Right. Uh, Normally a guy who you're dating his daughter, he doesn't take kindly to you, but, uh, you know, Desi and I gravitated towards each other, um, in a great sense because he was happy that I guess his daughter was probably fine, finally dating a guy with a, with a shoulder, a head on his shoulders, I guess, as they say, uh, and then, you know, I respected him. I was like, wow, you know, my lady's dad is a stud muffin. This guy's intelligent. He has an entrepreneurial background, all this stuff. So we kind of hit it off, but long story short, we're sitting at dinner one night and um, I couldn't even sit at dinner and it was at Chili's restaurant, like, you know, high class stuff, but I couldn't even sit at dinner because about every 10 minutes I had to get up from the dinner table, go outside, be on my cell phone on a sales rep call and handle my sales rep stuff. And then come back in, sit down, start eating another call. Another sales rep would call me, go back out. And he was looking at me just, and, and I can't imagine what he was thinking because it was an hour and a half dinner. And I probably sat at the table for 20 full minutes, right? Through the hour and a half. Cause I was working and he's like, he, he, I got, I got to the table and he looked at me and said, you know, how much long? Cause no one ever, no one ever asked me a question like this before, but Desi looked at me and he said, how much longer do you want to spend 10 to 12 hours a day? of your precious life that you only have one life, right? <laughs> precious moments. How many precious moments more do you want to spend 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week to make the income that you're making? And I was like, no one's really ever asked it to me like that, right? It was kind of like awakening. And I was like, huh? I was like, well, of, of course, right? And the answer, of, co of course, I'd quit yesterday, but how, you know, what am I going to do, right? I have bills. I got a mortgage. I got car payments. I got this. I got a great job. I'm highly respected. I have it easy where I work and I make good money. And what, what else would I do, right? Was the thing. And he said, man, with your background and your vigor and, and all of that and your knowledge of invest in, investments, raising capital, he says, I got to teach you about mortgage note investing. And that's when I found out about it. And that was in 2018. Okay. So 2000 and so, so 2018, it was so funny that, that, and you, you, you laugh a little bit about my progress in the space and stuff. And I appreciate it all, but it's like, it's funny to say in 2018, my response back was what the hell is a mortgage right. note? I think that's most everybody's <laughs> man. Okay. I had a mortgage note. I was paying one to Wells Fargo. Right. I, I know what I knew what paying on a mortgage note was because I had one, but I didn't understand what he said about learning how to buy discounted mortgage notes from banks, hedge funds and paper stack. Uh, so, you know, it was like, hey, I, I, I'm curious. Tell me about it. Right. And, and it all kind of started. The saga started there. Right. So in 2018, guys, I, I learned what mortgage note investing was. And at that time, I was still pretty much tied down with golden handcuffs to a high paying sales management job that I was working 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week and had no life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was like six months, maybe eight months of me just 
once a week kind of seeing Desi because, um, you know, Bethany is close with her family. So we were go out to lunch or go out to dinner or something. And it was like a continuous thing, like six or eight months. And he kept saying, so how'd you like driving in traffic this morning at 830? Wow. How'd you like giving that sales meeting in your suit and tie? How'd you, like, you know, I bet you're going to have to answer your phone here pretty soon and kind of joshing with me a little bit. But he was trying to drive home the point of um, that if we're not building any type of passive cash flow, even little by little, right? But if you're not building any, then next year you won't have any. I mean, that was yeah. his point, right? It's like, you're going to continue to have to put in the time and the effort to get the paycheck. And if you get sick or if you get injured or something happens and that paycheck's going to dry on up, you have no reliability and no freedom was his point. So uh, he taught me about mortgage notes over the six or eight months. And I was kind of sold. I said, man, and a matter of fact, Brett, you might agree with me, Brett, when, when people get past the uh, what the heck is a mortgage mm -hmm. note thing and they get to the ABCs and they get past that, a lot of the people's reactions next is, well, that sounds too good to be true. I see that. And I did that. I did that. And I did the like poke holes in it and try to tear holes in it and try to see where the too good to be true parts were and all that. And I was going to outsmart it. Right. And uh, that didn't work out that way. I found no holes in the game right? The, the banks created this game and banks aren't stupid. That's so uh, when I learned it wasn't too good to be true, I said, okay, I want to get into this note space. I feel like, I feel like I can do good at it. Uh, I had the knowledge base now of the ABCs of note investing, so, so to speak. Uh, and I was ready to do something, but Desi like put it on me too. He said, I hear you talking that you're interested in getting into this. And, and I know you're a big talker and, and I get it, but I don't see any commitment. You're still waking up the same schedule. You're still going to give your sales meeting. You're still having 25 sales reps under you. You're still working 10, 12 hours a day. You're still doing the same thing you've been doing since eight months ago when I told you about this stuff. I don't see any commitment that you really want to make a change. That also hit me. De yeah. Hey, Desi has a tendency to get you, Desi has a tendency to get you just right, man. Just poop, right? And so I'm like, hmm, hmm. I'm pretty competitive. You know me. I like golf. I'm super competitive. I like to try to be good at everything. I, I don't, I like challenges, you know? And so I just like looked at myself in the mirror after that. And I said, man, you know, I went entrepreneurial status with my invention company and it didn't go as well as planned. And I was able to get right back into sales management and a high paying sales management job, just like that with making a couple phone calls. <coughs> I go, really, what do I got to lose? I've done it before. So I literally, to show Desi, I was committed to learning this note space. I mean, you know, you guys have coaching, you know, there's a bunch of other coaches in the space. Some people sell coaching and people, you know, say, oh, investing money into myself and learning this stuff. I don't know. And gurus and co look, man, for me to get coached on this stuff, here's, here's what I did. I sold my house that I owned since 2010 in San Diego, California. I sold it. I moved to a different city, like maybe 30, 30 miles south. Uh, where I had my house to be five minutes away from where Desi lived. I got a little 400 square foot office. I put two desks back to back in that office. And then I handed in the keys to my sales management position with my 25 sales reps underneath me. And I put my whole life on the line, mm -hmm. you know, sink or swim all my chips in, in order to just be able to show Desi, I was committed enough to come sit in an office with him and not do what I was already doing. And, and really focus on something different <clears throat> and not have to work 10, 12 hours a day. And so, well, guys, you know that when I did that, first he was a little, first he was a little tripped out, like, whoa, okay. But he, he's, but I was committed. I was committed. You know, I was committed. If I look back, would I have rather have paid $10,000 for a coaching program or something and just get, yes. Right. You know, selling your house and uprooting your family when you have a six month old daughter and doing this kind of stuff. I don't expect most people to make that kind of commitment. But since, you know, my past, I was willing to go for it. Right. I'm willing to go for it. If I have a good invention idea or if I have a great idea that I think is a great path to success and I see it, I'm going to go for it. Why not? And that's how it happened. Got into notes and uh, I ended up having guys. And so I know you want me to get to my first note deal. Right. But this is this is how I arrived at my notes, how I arrived yeah, at my first note yeah. deal. I, so I, so I sold my house, um, and after paying off some debts and, uh, you know, some other th things that I had to, to deal with financially, I ended up with 70, <coughs> I ended up with 78,000 bucks. I had no job, no income and 78,000 bucks. So what did I do? 
I invested all of it, but four grand. I think I invested 74 grand or something, something close to that. But yeah. So, so one of my first notes I bought guys with that little bit of money that I had from the sale of my house, one of the first notes I bought, um, well, and a matter of fact, this is a funny story for the people listening, but I, I bought two non-performing notes. Ooh. My first two. One was for one was for thirty one thousand seven hundred, and the other one was for thirty seven thousand in change. Oh my gosh! And dude, so that's much wiggle room. <laughs> that was my that was my money, boys. That was my money, boys. And I was back to had four thousand bucks in my bank account or something. I don't know. I don't know what I had left over. But that was where I went. That was where I went with it. So I bought one non-performing note in um, Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. And I bought another non-performing note in a in a uh, in a place in Michigan, Mansalona, Michigan. Okay. So those were the first two notes that I bought. And I'll give you the long story, right? Because then we got into COVID and then we got into all sorts of weird stuff in our note investing market that made things goofy, right? Uh, So long story short for everybody listening, and I'll make it really short. Uh, On the Cleveland, Ohio note, which was the 31,000 and change note, I ended up, I think I lost, I think I lost like 15,000 bucks on that deal ultimately. Cause I bought it for 31,000, but I put another like 10,000 or something into it by way of clean outs and yard care and so much stuff. Cause I had holding costs. I had to hold that thing for like almost two oh, years. Uh, yeah, it was taxes. a gnarly one. And then I ended up losing like, yeah, yeah. Taxes, property taxes, lawn mowing. I mean, you name it, right. To keep the city off your back for fines and everything else. I mean, you know, holding costs. Right. So I was in it for a lot more than what I had bought it for. And in the original, and just so people know, in the in the original time when I purchased it, we couldn't have predicted COVID and the country being shut mm-hmm. down and the world being shut down. So that wasn't in my due diligence <laughs> process. So ju- ju- just to, just to, just to, <laughs> just to clear things up, right? When I bought it, the plan, the exit strategy, the numbers, and everything looked juicy and sweet. After two years of the house being vacant, vacant, more dilapidation, roof leaks extra money and holding costs spent and all of those things that were because of the COVID thing. That's what ruined the deal. So it wasn't a bad deal when I bought it guys, it was ready to be rock and roll, yeah. but, um, but the timing wasn't right. Once again, folks, timing wasn't right. And something I was out of my control happened and this is lessons learned. But so I lost 15 G's on, on the one in Cleveland. Okay. Now the, to, to put some nice sauce on the story, the one that I got in Michigan that I bought for 37 grand, I ended up doing a $99,000 loan modification, um, $99,000 loan mod with a fresh 20 year amortized term at 9.9% interest rate. And I have collected $948 a month mortgage payment off of that thing for the last 27 months or so, there you go. 26 months or so. That works. Uh, so I just recently, and I recently got a call and this is great for your show because literally a week ago, I got a call from my servicing company, uh, and email and, and requesting payoff. Well, lo and behold, who calls me because he has my number and, and, and I had a good relationship with the borrower because I did the loan mod for him and stuff. And he feels like he know he feels like he loves me. He calls me Mr. Patrick and stuff. And I helped him out because when I bought that one in Michigan, he was going to be going towards foreclosure mm. and his balance, his balance was 114 grand mm. total payoff. I wiped, I wiped 15,000 of his debt away because I could, and I felt bad for his story and he was a little bit upside down. I think his property was worth like a hundred and 5,000 at the time. And I didn't want the dude who'd been there for like 13 years or whatever to be upside down because he hadn't paid his mortgage payment, like two and a half years. One of those weird equity there gave him some incentive and life is good. I wiped 15 G's away, did the new loan mod and collected. And I just got the um, payoff amount approved a few days ago, guys. This is so funny. Full circle. This is my first note I bought back when I started one of the first ones I bought and um, I'm getting a total payoff. He's selling the house to his grandson. And yeah, so, so I collected $948 a month cash flow off of that note for 27 or 28 months, something like that uh, now. And, um, and now the total payoff that I'm owed back is 94,000 and change. <laughs> and I, I bought that one for 37,000. Perfect. Right? So, 
So, so it, was, it was such a good experience, guys, right? The way I got into it, number one, I was risking, I was risking all the money I had. So that took some, some cojones. And then I got two lessons learned. One, you can lose money in a note deal. Not everything's all rainbows and butterflies because you, there's things you can't predict. And two, you also can hit some pretty good home runs in this game. And I got that right off the bat, right? Even, yeah, that's, that's so good. Wow. Cause even stuff that looks like it's like maybe a base hit turns into a home run pretty quickly. And you're like, well, you know, I'm 924, you know, 10 grand a year on my $37,000 investment. That's a good return. And then I'm going to do that for almost three years. And then I'm going to go ahead and collect that lump sum payoff. And next thing you know, you're like, huh, that's, that's neighboring on the vicinity of a, a you know, just an insane return. I mean, it's already an insane return, but you yeah. start getting up there to that. That's awesome, man. That's that's those are the stories we like to hear. You're, it's just such a fascinating background where you came from and what you've been doing. And wow, to go through two different, you know, I've been through the two cycles also, the 08 and then the, the pandemic. But to have, you know, two good things came out of that, I guess. That's well, true. Yeah. yeah. A marriage and then also yeah. a good lesson. So yeah. You started buying notes. You kept buying notes, I assume. You've been learning the business. What are you guys doing now? Well, I'll give it to people. I know, I know you, a lot of new folks maybe want to watch these shows, right, to get some some inspiration maybe. And I'll, I'll give some people some inspiration. I, I'm nothing special. Of course, I have a, a, a sales and entrepreneurial background, which helped me when I first learned about notes because what you bring to the table when you get into this game counts for something. Um, so I, I won't you know, throw myself under the bus there. I'm just going to say that, you know, I'm nothing special. And I didn't know what a note was in 2018. I bought my first two notes in 2019. And by 2021, I had 20, 20 some odd notes in my portfolio. Wow. Right. Through, through a, a pandemic time, right. Through a, a pandemic time. Yeah. So, you know, and I was beginning to set myself free financially. And, and when I say that, I mean that it didn't happen overnight. I had to replace my income by making spreads and doing other things in the note space and not just relying upon adding another additional hundred bucks or 200 bucks or 300 bucks passive cash flow one at a time. Cause I was looking, I needed to replace eight to $10,000 a month income. Right. Right. And so, you know, you can't do that. People say, well, it'd be nice to get into the note space, but you know, I see you guys making 200 bucks a month per deal and everything or whatever. And that 200 bucks a month ain't going to pay my bills. You're right. It ain't. But for each deal that you do, if you're clever enough, you can actually pay yourself up front when you do the deal. And so my goal was to do a deal or two or three a month and make some upfront spread to compensate for my lost income stream. And at right. the same time, for each one of those deals I did, I was adding another layer of passive cash flow. And mm -hmm. for each of those deals, build up, build up, build up. When you have 20 or 25 notes now in your portfolio, even if you're only making two or 300 bucks each off of each of those notes and you've got 25, 27 of them, then it starts to look sexy at that point. Right. Right. And so then I was addicted. Of course, you guys understand. Right. You know, I'm competitive and I I see the light and I understand this investment vehicle very well. Right. And starting in 2021, I've I've built a portfolio. I've utilized my own money. I've now utilized the OPM strategies that we're able to use in this business. And uh, and I was addicted. So it was like, how do you get bigger in the business? Right. The only way I know to get bigger is not by you, you don't get that much more education. You know, once you know about everything there is to know about the note space as far as trading um, partials, um, you know, using OPM and doing all these things. Well, how do you get bigger? Well, you, you only get bigger by having um, more money at your behest. Right. You, you can only get bigger by elevating your trades, the size of your trades. Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's when Desi and I decided we would start a fund. And uh, Everly May, my daughter, oh. uh, Everly May is my daughter's name. And so we decided, hey, let's name the fund after her. And it's maybe a fun spin off of like Fannie Mae or something. Uh, but her real name is Everly May. So we weren't trying to spin it off of Fannie Mae. It just kind of it matches. Works. But yeah, so we started a our first $20 million fund. Um, that has continued to grow uh, well over the past two and a half, three years. We've now got, I don't know, $12 million deployed in investments out there, uh, notes and things that we're managing, still raising some capital for that fund. And then we've got our next fund set up, which is more so of about a $100 million fund. Uh, and 
lesson learned for people that that are are listening to this too. It's like, look, man, I had to make a big commitment and I had to change my whole life to get into the note space. And I'm glad I did because being in the money business and being in the note space has opened up other doors. Right. Um, and so now we're building 300 apartment units in Palm Bay, Florida. I'm getting involved with some land entitlement deals at a much larger scale with a larger team of people um, and so forth. So, you know, here I go from not knowing what a note was and being a full time sales manager just 2017 and 18 to coming up into now being a, a large fund manager in the space um, and also, you know, diversifying a little bit into some other areas of development and so forth. So I wouldn't be here. I mean, it could have been that easy, guys. You know, it could have been. I could have just said, ah, yeah, Desi, that sounds cool, but I'm busy. And mm -hmm. I could have stayed working 10 to 12 hours a day. And from 2018 or 19 till now would have gone by just as quickly. We know three and five years of life just goes by. Mm -hmm. And I could have just still yeah. been. I could have still been working 10, 12 hours a day sales manager. There's bottom line. So for, for, I think motivation for anybody listening that wants to get into this space or you don't have to go crazy like me and quit your whole job and everything. There's easier ways nowadays, right? I mean, we, like we created Node Investor University, you guys know, so we can have a really easy, awesome platform for people to, you know, cut time and energy. They don't have to sell their house and buy an office and sit with Desi for a year in a room. Um, <laughs> that's what I had to do. But get into it and get into it slowly because it's about becoming a different person so that when you become that different person opportunities that are placed in front of you you're willing to accept i guess if somebody would have told me in 2018 hey do you want to build 300 apartment units in palm bay florida i would i would have said Ow. sounds nifty but sounds nifty but i have no idea that's way over my i have no idea what do you whatever Sounds good. But as I grew and as I, as you grow and you learn and you soak things up and you get around the right people, that's what you really need to do because it's the transformation of who you become. And maybe a year or two from now, you who are listening, that maybe you're just learning about what notes are or something. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you're better than me, faster than me. Maybe like, you know, uh, this guy, Carlo, I, I need to tell you this guys, this is awesome, right? This guy, Carlo gets in our group and he has a financial background. So sometimes what you already have in your background that you bring to the plate can advance you, right? And it's so crazy. Carlo gets in our coaching group. We've coached Carlo for like four to six months now, and he's ready to raise. He's already raised a million dollars from eight investors. He's already raised a million bucks, and he's got us on track to raise ten to twenty-five million for our new fund. That's crazy. That's he's been in the game. He's been in the game four to six months because he brought that from his background, right? And I think it's like I think the key to that is just make the commitment whether or not you're committing to making the jump like you did or you're making the commitment maybe you're not maybe you're not you maybe you're not somebody who's like i'm all in i'm gonna do this this is i'm changing careers you might be somebody who's just making a commitment going you know what i'm all in on notes i think it's a great investment strategy i'm keeping my nine to five I'd like to do this where I'm just going to buy notes with my self-directed retirement account. Or maybe you're like, you know what? I don't even want to do that. I just want to invest in the fund mm. who's going to be already doing that. And I want to invest in somebody who's already all in. So I think it's important for people to understand that the, it's, it's not necessarily about the drastic change and, hey, I'm changing my lifestyle. That's what worked for you. But it's really well, about- I'm crazy. <laughs> But it's about making the commitment. That's that's what I'm, my takeaway is. It's like, look, be decisive, be committed. If you're going to do something, commit to it and do it. You know, we we kind of joke around the office. It, it's be about it, don't talk about it. Oh yeah, we haven't said that in a while. But that's Boom. it. Be about it, don't be talk about, about it. it. Don't talk about it. Like do it. And so I think Boom. that's the thing is is a commitment. So what we ask people like, what would be a piece of advice you'd give to? somebody new and as I they may have just covered it, but, um, be about it. Don't talk about it. Yeah. Done. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look here, here, here's, here's the reality. What I think people have trouble understanding a little bit. Um, you know, we, we've all been taught, everybody's been taught for three generations now. So that's difficult to try to change mindset of three generations of teaching from grandparents to parents to us. But, you know, that work hard, get a good job, work hard, the harder you work, the more you make. And those kinds of lessons that we were taught um, are bogus, you know, that, that's just bogus. It's just not true. Uh, your skills. Yeah, your skill. Well, and it's always been this way, really, right? Your skills and expertise 
have value. People, I think, have forgotten this. Okay. Like skills and expertise have value, right? Why does a heart surgeon get paid so much money? Is that is it validated? I don't know. They're operating on people that are going to die without them, and they have a special skill set and knowledge to be able to literally save someone's life by repairing their heart inside their body and sewing them back up. Man, is that a heck of a skill set? Woo. Okay. Well, they deserve to make some good money for that. They're saving people's lives. Well, think of this, okay? You know, the the knowledge and the skill sets and the expertise have value. Okay. There are a lot of people out in this world that are very busy, like a heart surgeon, for instance, right? Or your dentist, where you go to get your teeth cleaned and such. There's a million people out here, folks, that have money to invest. Can we agree? The the people that could write a $50,000 check to do an investment, dime a dozen. They're your dentist, the guy that owns the three taco shops. The, I mean, there's people that can make investments and they listen to so many different people on where to put their money. Like the banker at Wells Fargo, their buddy who has the new Dogecoin idea where they're going to get rich all of a sudden, their buddy's barbecue restaurant startup, their the stock market, 401k, IRA, come on. And they're listening to all these people advising them to, to put their money there. Well, if you become valuable by way of expertise and skill set in a certain investment category, like notes, you become really valuable to those people that have money. I just want people to understand that, right? You're more valuable to them than their CPA, their stockbroker, their financial advisor, because they're not able to, to get them into these note investments like you can, that are secured by real estate, spit off monthly cash flow, have a great yield, all those great things that come with notes. You can be the savior to someone's retirement with your skills. So educate yourself and improve your skill set. Have a, a sharp, sharp note investing skill set through education. Learn. Perfect. And then learn how to raise capital. Well, you gotta, then just, to, well that, that's that comes well, first is learn. Yeah, I yeah. think that's it. And then that's what the, the first thing I tell everybody is educate yourself. And I say the same thing. Like, look, there's a lot of free stuff out there. Uh, I didn't do it that route. I went and kind of just did it on my own. And then I went and got a mentor and I paid for it. But I realized, I, you know, I, for me, you know, it was worth 25000 to pay for it because I learned so much in such a short period of time that it would have taken me a lot longer to learn it on my own. And I probably would have lost more capital along the way making investments than if I just paid somebody and stood on the shoulders of those who've already done it. So, well, good stuff, man. I That's a fascinating story. I know our, our, our listeners are going to love that one. That was a good one. Um, yeah, really appreciate you coming on here. How can people get in touch with you or or if they're interested in maybe uh, investing alongside you, doing your education, something along those lines, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? I'm always available in an open book. So you can get me at Patrick at investbrilliantly.com. So that's my email, Patrick at investbrilliantly.com. And uh, yeah, just shoot me an email, say, hey. And uh, if you're interested in, and I, you know, guys, and this is another thing, I guess another piece of advice, and you guys are, are here too, but I want to have a place for everybody. Right. I want to have a place for everybody. You know, not everybody can afford twenty five thousand dollars on coaching. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, it'd be nice. But, you know, not everybody can do that. So we have a place for everybody. If you want to learn, we have Node Invest University. You can learn. We have several programs there, all affordability levels. Uh, great. If you want to invest very passively, then, yes, we have the fund. You can invest money and not have to become the expert and rely upon our entire team to do what we do best. And uh, there's all sorts of different areas where we can put you. You want to be an expert? We'll get you there. You don't want to be an expert. You want to invest with some experts? We'll get you there. You want to buy a note for your IRA and have a couple in your own portfolio? We'll help you buy some. So, you know, whatever you really need, we've got you. And just reach out again, Patrick at investbrilliantly.com, and we can have a chat. Perfect. Oh. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much, Patrick. It's been a it's been a great one. This is a good one. It's nice when we get to bring people on who are, you know, not only knowledgeable but interesting and tell tell great stories. So, that is it for this edition of my first note purchase. We hope to catch you on the next one. This is Rick Allen, Fred Berkey, signing off. See you.